modeling putty on my nose cone has dried. And so now I'm going to take some 150 grit sandpaper and sand that down. Um, and just warning ahead of time here, this stuff will really clog up your sandpaper, so you might want to have some extra ready. Okay, so we're getting down up here to almost nothing, and that's what we're looking for. So we want it just filling in the gaps there, but not building up on the sides. Well, you do have to be careful. You can go too far and pull it back out of the cracks. And now I'm going to move to 220 grit sandpaper and smooth this all in. Alright, now when you go to wipe off the sanding dust here, be careful if you're using alcohol or water because that will remove the remaining filler putty. So just very quick wipes there. Now what I'm going to do is treat this with a universal bonding primer that's specifically made to bond to difficult, uh, difficult surfaces like polyethylene, polypropylene. And then after that, I will prime it again with a filling primer that can be sanded, and that will fill in any remaining gaps and cracks and scratches here. While I'm still waiting for the fillets to cure, I want to come back to the nose cone here. And I have sprayed this with the universal bonding primer. And that leaves it with kind of a rough finish. Uh, and this is apparently um, what it's supposed to do. Because that rough finish gives the next coat of paint something to bond onto. So I'm not going to try and sand the rough spots, at least not yet. And instead I'm going to now add several coats of a filling sandable primer that will fill in any of the remaining uh, grooves and such here. And then I can start sanding that down and anything that's still projecting up here will get sanded down as well. While the epoxy fillets are still curing, we can move ahead and work on the payload section. And so the first thing we're going to do is assemble this bulkhead plate and add a uh, screw eye here. So the first thing you can do is simply screw the screw eye into the hole. It looks like they didn't quite get all the wood out of there with the laser cut, but we'll just force it in. And it doesn't matter which face you have outward, whichever you prefer. All right, so I'm going to screw this in just before I end, run out of threads here. So you can just see the top thread or so there. And we've got lots of threads exposed in here. And then this is going to fit in to the aft end of the coupler here. And we're going to leave just a little bit of space around it. Okay, And then eventually we will put that coupler into the payload section like that and we'll have the bulkhead there and that's going to give us a really deep payload section. Okay. Now in the instructions it has us gluing the coupler 
into the payload section, which you can do, but I'm going to show you a way to make this a little bit more versatile. So I'm going to go ahead and mix up some epoxy so that we can uh, lock in the screw eye as well as put it into our coupler here. Here I've mixed up some five minute epoxy and you can use longer working times if you prefer. And so the first thing I'm going to do is just completely cover that screw eye thread. All right, and then we're going to put in a bead of epoxy right inside. Yeah, put down a paper towel here. Right inside here. We actually don't want it to go too far back. I've kind of wasted some up there. All right, and then we're going to pop this in. All right, and again, we want to adjust it so we have just a little bit of a lip showing there. And go ahead and wipe off any excess that's on the outside of the coupler. Okay, now I'm going to let this cure, um, but when it's done, we're also going to put some epoxy around that lip there, as well as across the entire wood area. I made up a little more epoxy here, and I'm going to spread this all over. And this is just going to help protect the wood from the ejection gases as well as form a fillet around the edge for added strength. And then if you have any slop there like I did, go ahead and just wipe out the wipe off the outer surface before the epoxy hardens. And once again I'll let this cure. While the epoxy is hardening on the coupler, I want to show you another option here. So this is the payload section from another high tech. And I modified this one a little bit. Uh, for one thing, I cut off the base of the um, nose cone here to allow for more room and for the possibility of actually putting something up into the nose cone so I could have a very long payload in here. The other thing I did was down here at the bottom, uh, instead of gluing my coupler in, I used three plastic rivets. And this allows me to remove this and open up the payload bay. And then inside here, instead of just having the coupler, I put in an avionics bay sled. Um, this particular one you can get as a kit from Apogee Components and it even includes the coupler itself. Okay, so you could make a coupler like this and put it in there if you're not doing dual deployment or experiments or anything like that. It requires a flight computer. And instead, if you wanted to do some dual deployment or something that does require a flight computer, you could simply switch out the coupler and use this. There we go. So 
So if you go with the uh, eBay here, it comes with attachment points. It's made out of wood instead of a screw eye. Yeah, but this can be pulled out and removed from the coupler and we've got an entire uh, avionics sled here. Okay, so even if you don't think you're going to do this anytime in the near future, um, if you go ahead and attach the payload or the uh, payload coupler here using those plastic rivets, that gives you the freedom to change things later on. The epoxy has cured enough that we can work with the coupler again here. And so the first thing I'm going to do is draw a line at the halfway point. Let's see, I bet this is six inches. Yep. Alright, so halfway is going to be three inches. Right there. That will just be a guide so we know how far to put it up inside the cup, or up inside the payload bay. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and measure this for um, rivets. And I want to do it I'm going to go ahead and measure this for the rivets, and they need to be five centimeters from the aft end of the payload bay. And right now I'm just making some tick marks across the circumference here. Now I'm going to take a flexible tape and run that around the circumference at my five centimeter tick marks there. Run that all the way around. Okay, just make sure I'm lining up along those. Alright, and that's going to give me a total circumference. Okay, so that's 21 of 21.3 centimeters, which we means we need to put a rivet at every 7.1. Okay, so that's 7.1 there. The next one would be at 14.2. Don't let that slip. And then the last one all the way back here at 21.3. Okay. Now we're going to slide this in up to that halfway point. And I'm just going to put a little bit of masking tape on here so that it doesn't move. Now I'm using a 5 millimeter diameter by 8 millimeter long rivet. Um, you can get these in small numbers from Apogee Components and a few other retailers. Uh, or you can get them in larger numbers from places like Amazon, which is where I got this. And I think a a hundred pack of these was something like about five or six dollars. So it's if you're going to do a lot of building using these things, I would go with the Amazon ones. Okay, so what we need to do is drill holes at our marked points through both the coupler and the uh, payload tube here. Now, unless you have metric drill bits, you have to guess a little bit. If I remember right, this is an approximately 3 16 inch bit. And you can go ahead and measure your drill bit against this. And if you're not sure, start with something that's a little bit smaller and then work your way up, test fitting each time. Okay, so I'm going to do that off camera and then come back. I've drilled out my holes and it turns out that 11 64ths is the proper drill bit for these. And so this should go in uh, without a lot of wobble in it. And then if you push it all the way in, that, you know, that locks it into place. 
so it can't come out easily. And then if you pull the sec the middle section out, then that releases it again. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to do here is I'm going to harden these holes with a little bit of super glue. And that's just going to make it so that they don't wear out after repeated use. So just take a little bit and let it soak into the fibers there. Um, and as, also after hardening these, you can sand them to get rid of these little flanges of paper. Or you can leave the paper on. Uh, it does give you something else to bite into with the... Um, rivets. And you may find that you need to re-drill these after you've used the super glue on them here, and that's no big deal. Alright, I'm going to do the same thing here. Now in this case I get paper up on top which I will also want to remove but that too will be easier once they're hardened and you may need to put some on both sides depending on how much it seeps through Alright, so I'm going to let those dry for about an hour, and then we'll come back and sand those, and then check the fit once more. The super glue is dry, so now I'm just going to take a little bit of 220 sandpaper, and just sand the ridges there. Sides look okay, and then here on the coupler, you do the same thing. Inside there, you can see I did not sand those all the way flat. And I'm doing that purposely as it gives it more material for the rivets to hold on to. Okay, so now this can go together. I just need to match up the holes. Okay, and then we can put the rivets in when we're ready to assemble everything. Now I'm going to paint my payload bay separately from the rest of the rocket, so I'm not going to assemble it at this time. The epoxy on the fillets has fully cured and can be sanded. And I've done a little bit up here on the launch lug already just to get rid of some excess that got on top there. Um, but coming back to the fillets here, we want to decide if we want to build this up anymore or leave it the way it is. And I found what's useful is to have a round object that you can wrap sandpaper around and then you just run that in the groove here. For example, this is another high tech here. Um, and this has some really built up uh, fillets there. And I made those using... Um, the epoxy putty initially, and then I gave them a final coating of wood filler. And then I used um, a spent D engine as a core for my sandpaper to get a uniform sanding radius in here. Okay, now for this one, I don't think I'm going to go quite that big, but I'm going to use the same idea. 
Here I have some spent motor casings, and so I've got a 13 millimeter, an 18 millimeter, and a 24 millimeter, and I can compare these to what's already here. So if I put up my 13 millimeter motor there, uh, if I were to use that as a sanding guide, I probably wouldn't need to do much buildup of the material there. Okay, because that's let's see how it looks on the front here. Yeah, it's going to need a little bit, but it's almost the right size just as it is. All right, if I use an 18 millimeter motor, right, that's going to require a bit more buildup, but not a lot. And if I use 24, that's going to be, need a lot more material in there yet. Okay, so I'm going to either go with the 13 or the 18, depending on how it looks after we add the wood filler to this. Um, and this uh, is already kind of naturally rough, so I am not going to do any sanding of that. Okay, so here I've got some wood filler. And this, you can get this in a lot of different brands. I know Elmer's has one. This is DAP. Uh, I think even Minwax has a brand of this. Nice, fresh, brand new here. And so I'm going to use a large tongue depressor sized applicator here. Alright, now this stuff is non toxic and water soluble. See? You can handle it as much as you need to, and the worst you'll get is dirty hands. Okay, and the nice thing about this that is a little bit harder with the epoxy paste is you can just use your fingers to mold things where you need them to go. Alright, and if you need to do a little more smoothing, um, you can use either water or some rubbing alcohol on your fingers. And that just moistens it enough to let you smooth stuff in like that. All right. Now if you're using alcohol, it evaporates quicker, um, but it also will not raise or warp the grain of the wood as much as water does. Okay. And I'm going to continue this on the other fillets, but I'll do it off camera. So here's what it looks like after I've applied the wood filler. And it looks kind of sloppy, but this stuff sands up really easily. Now if you want some really heavy fillets like I showed on that other rocket, um, before you do this you'll probably want to put another layer of epoxy putty on there. Uh, because if you get this wood filler too thick, it's going to crack and pop back out. Um, also, at this point, you don't want to get any water on it because it will re-soften and such, which if you need to reshape is fine. Um, but you don't want to launch a naked rocket with this type of wood filler on it. So I'm going to let this stuff dry, and then we'll be able to sand it. But while it's drying, we can do something else here. Um, using the same wood filler, we can dilute it with a little bit of water or alcohol and then use it as a sanding sealer. Okay, so I'm just going to give myself a blob there. Uh, it doesn't matter if you use a metric blob or an imperial blob, either one's fine. Alright, and now I'm going to, you want to add about half that amount of liquid, whether it's water or alcohol. Um, you might even start with less than that and mix it up and see how it goes. But you want it to be about the consistency of latex paint.
That looks pretty good. Maybe just a little bit more there. Now if you get too much liquid, you can either add more of the wood filler to it, or just let it sit and evaporate for a little while. Now to apply this, you can use a cotton swab, or you can use an actual paintbrush. Alright, now this won't permanently stick to work surfaces, but just to be careful. Go ahead and rotate this around. Alright, so here you just paint the fins. Kind of work it down into the grain as much as you can. All right, and this doesn't need to be very thick, uh, especially with these fins where it's a fairly tight grain to begin with. Okay, and as you'll notice here, it dries pretty quickly when it's this thin. If it's getting too thick, just add a little bit more liquid to it. Right, and it's a good idea to do both sides of a fin as quickly as possible so the liquid doesn't cause warpage. It's not a, as much of a problem with plywood fins like these, uh, but if you're using single ply like balsa or basswood, uh, it can become more of a problem. So now all that just needs to dry and when it's completely dried we can sand it and shape it. While the wood filler, sanding sealer and all that good stuff is drying we can work on the recovery system here. Alright so we've got a 30 inch parachute. It's got a built-in spill hole here um, and these will come in various colors. Mine is black. Right, so the first thing you do is just go ahead and fold that out and then find all of the loops here. So untangle them all and there should be looks like four of them. Okay so the first thing I'm going to do is simply put these all on one finger and this may not work well under this so big here. All right, but then I'm going to grab the middle of the parachute sheet here. So I'm going to hold on to it by its spill hole. All right, and then over on my hand here I can move these back and forth to get equal relative lengths. Okay, so if I've got this adjusted properly, pretty much all these edges here where they attach should be in the same spot. Alright, so once you've got that, go ahead and hang on to this part here. And for the moment, I'm just going to wrap some masking tape around this so I don't lose my spot. Alright, I'm going to set that aside for a moment. Alright, coming back to our shock cord here. Alright, so if you want to do their way of doing this, we're going to attach the parachute to the shock cord at about a third of the length of the shock cord. And you can even be a little bit shorter if you want. So here's where it's going to attach to the payload section. Okay, and I'm just going to 
come down here let's see it's about roughly four feet okay so this has got a 15 foot shock cord so a third of the distance would be five feet four feet's fine uh, and what I'm going to do here is we're just going to take and make another loop just using an overhand knot okay you want to get that loop big enough that you'll be able to pass the uh, shroud lines through it. All right. If you want, you can put a little glue in there to lock it in place. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, because this, even if this comes undone, it'll still be attached. Alright, now, the quick link they give you is going to go on the end, and then this is going to attach to the payload section. Now, note something here. Um, it's telling us to, to tie the other end of the shock cord onto the eyelet, okay? Um, and they're securing it with a, a double knot. Now, we're not using the eyelet of our nose cone, we're using the screw eye of the payload section. Okay, and I think these are kind of generic instructions here. Um, we do have a quick link here. And what I'm going to use it for is to attach the shock cord to the payload section, which is currently being primered. All right, and then down here, what they want us to do is pass all of these loops. through the loop that we made about a third of the way down. Then you open this up and you pass the entire parachute through it. Now, to do that I'll probably even have to open up the masking tape there. All right, so if you have to, you can go ahead and take off the masking tape or just scoot it down. All right, but you're going to just pass the whole thing through here, pull the shroud lines through until it cinches down and then you can use um, either some uh, wood glue, or I would just use a little bit of masking tape, to lock that knot in place. Now, I'm not going to actually do that. What I am going to do instead is use a ball bearing swivel. Okay, and so you just take all the loops here and pass it through either end of this. It doesn't really make a difference. Right, so through one of those eyelets. Now this does not come with the kit. You have to get this extra. Um, some fishing places will have them because they're used in um, large game fishing. All right. Otherwise you may have to go online. I, I actually bought these through Amazon. Okay, so I've got that hanging there. And now I'm going to take the entire swivel, pass it through the loops, pull the loops down and then pull the whole thing tight like that All right, and then I'm going to use a piece of tape right around here to keep that knot from moving um, you can use electrical tape I'm using some heavy masking tape uh, you can also use heat shrink tubing if you're careful uh, but you just want something there so that these are naturally going to try and come undone and that will keep it from coming off there. All right, and then I'm going to take another quick link and this also does not come with the kit. Um, these you can get at most hardware stores though. Okay, and I'm going to attach the parachute there. And here I can take this masking tape off now. All right, I'm going to take this back out through the loop that we had. All right, and now I'm going to attack, uh, attach the quick link to the loop and then cinch that down. Now this is going to add a few more grams to the weight, um, but 
trust me, it's not going to affect the flying of this rocket. Um, this thing goes up high regardless of what you do to it. Okay, so now we're going to have a quick link at the end that's going to attach to the payload section. All right, we have a quick link, a swivel, and our parachute attaching about four feet down. And then the rest of this goes off into the rocket. Okay, now the nice thing about this is it, you can take your parachute off when you're not flying. So some people don't like to leave the parachutes in the rockets because they tend to get crumpled up more or less permanently. It's not a big, as big a deal with a nylon one. But it also means you can interchange them. All right, so maybe you're flying something a little heavier in your payload section and you want to put a 36 inch parachute on instead of the 30. This lets you change that out really quickly. Okay, and then you can either just store the parachute like this or what I'll usually do is I'll store the parachute with the swivel and keep the quick link on the shock cord so I don't lose it. I almost forgot here. The parachute protector can go over the um, shock cord here. All right. And this looks kind of small to me. You might want to invest in a little bit larger one. They're not very expensive. In fact, if you have basic sewing skills, you can just buy a sheet of um, Nomex and make your own. Okay, and that should pop over that knot. If it doesn't, we can untie it. There we go. And this, this you can just run down to the base of the um, shock cord. And you won't really need it until we're ready to pack this for launch. My wood filler has dried for several hours. And so now I'm taking a 18 millimeter engine. And I've wrapped that in 150 grit sandpaper. And now I'm just going to use that to sand into the fillets here. And as you can see, we're, we're going to make a lot of dust doing this. We can also use this to do some shaping here to round off the edges. Alright, so you can see like right in here there's a little bit of a divot there. Um, and we can either get rid of that by sanding it more and decreasing the thickness of the fillet or we can come back and add a little more filler there either using the wood filler or uh, contour putty and then take a look at both sides and see if they are even they are not we need more sanding over here Alright, and then you'll also notice here that we still have material outside of the fillet and we'll just sand that with some regular sandpaper here. Alright, I'm going to periodically have to vacuum this off here just because we do make so much dust. So after vacuuming, um, you can see where we still need to do a little bit of work in here. Alright, so this is going to require a little more sanding down here and probably have to refill this area.
So I'm going to continue doing this all the way around the rocket. So we'll do the same thing for the fins, except for the fins we're also going to need to sand off the uh, filler that we used as a sanding sealer as well. Here I've given the fillets all some initial sanding, just to kind of get an idea of how my depth is doing. Okay, and so I'm going to continue doing this and then also start uh, removing the excess from the fins themselves. Here's what my fillets look like after the initial round of wood filler followed by some relatively coarse sanding here. So I've sanded everything with 100 grit sandpaper and it's not finished yet. We're in kind of an intermediate stage here. Okay, so you can still see there's you know scratch marks from the 100 grit sandpaper. Um, as I removed a lot of the wood filler, we can see some imperfections and little valleys and such in here that are going to need refilled. All right, and then the same thing up here on the launch lug fillet. Um, it's a little bit further along, but as you can see, there are some little craters and cracks here that are going to need refilled. Now to do that, you can either use more of the wood filler, or you can use something finer, like the um, contour putty here, which is what I'm going to use. And so for this, I can just apply a small amount to those imperfections. And then I'll simply smooth those over with a finger. And then let those dry. And this can this is used a lot like the wood putty. It is water soluble. So we can just fill in things like this. All right, and then coming around to the fins, um, I'm probably going to do some more sanding on these before I add more filler to them. All right, so after my uh, putty here dries, then I'm going to uh, start sanding with finer sandpaper. I'll go up to 150 grit, do the, the final shaping, and then also... Um, if needed, go up to 220 grit to get a nice smooth surface. Now, if you don't like the spirals in the tubes here, you can also use either one of these, but the, the contour putty works better to fill in those spirals and then sand it. Now, I'm going to use some right here. This is an imperfection in the tube. That'll just fill in that crack there. Um, I'm not so worried about tube spirals, though. Okay, so I'm going to let the uh, putty dry there and then go back to sanding. I've gone through another round of sanding of the fillets here, a little bit finer paper. And then as you can see, I've sprayed the area with a fillable, sandable primer. And this is doing a few things for me. One is it brings out the imperfections better so I can see them to see where I still need to sand and where I need to fill in some areas. Um, also in areas where um, we've been sanding the tube itself, it helps lock those little uh, fibers of cardboard down so that those can be sanded more smoothly later on. All right, same thing up here on the launch lug. Okay, it's almost done. It just needs a little bit more sanding and a, a little bit of filler in a few small areas there. So after the, the primer dries here, I'll go back to sanding and filling, and then eventually I'll do the the entire tube with the same primer here. Right now I left a handhold. Here are my nose cone and payload section. And the payload section has had two coats of um, filling sandable primer on it. And then I've sanded this with 320 grit sandpaper. And it's ready to be recoated with the primer again and then painted. The nose cone has had two coats of universal bonding primer followed by two coats of the fillable sandable primer and this has also been sanded. And you can see the little white flecks here, that's where the uh, bonding primer is showing through here after sanding and that's fine, it's normal. And likewise this needs another couple of coats of primer and then we'll be able to give it a finished coat. Here I have a cautionary tale. So my intention had been to um, make the 
upper portion of the body tube this really nice fluorescent yellow and using this uh, Rust-Oleum fluorescent series of paints. I've used it before for small things uh, but this was the first time I, was, I tried doing it on a high power rocket and so I've got a, a gloss white base coat and I was spraying this on in nice even layers here um, it seemed to go on really quickly and, and dry really quickly and so I sprayed on another one and sprayed on another one and then this happened um, basically the paint shrank and pulled away from itself over the base coat here and this is one of the most impressive alligator skins I have ever seen um, it almost looks geomorphic here like canyons uh, and so now I'm in the processing of sanding this back off again and I'll probably have to reprime it and here I have the painted rocket and as I mentioned before I had some horrible paint problems with the main body of this and I just ended up painting it a good basic gloss black and then the uh, payload and nose cone sections here are painted with metallic blue that actually came out really well and our last task here is to put this whole thing together now I'm not going to do the decals on video because I'm not sure how I'm going to do mine quite yet. But that's easy enough to do at just about any point afterward. Right, so what I'm going to do here is get our shock cord back out of the body. Okay, and we've already installed the parachute protector here. I'm just going to go through the shock cord and make sure it's not all tangled up. All right, so there's our parachute protector. And um, again, we, earlier we installed uh, two quick links here. So one to allow the parachute um, not to be attached to the screw eye. You can if you want. All right, and then this one to actually attach to the payload section. So I'm going to go ahead and open this one up. Okay, and that can go on here. All right, and if you're only going to use the one quick link, then your parachute's also going to go on that as well. Okay, and then here we have the parachute to which I had already attached a swivel here. And so that is going to go on my second quick link. All right. And then to put this all together, I don't have room to do all this at once under the camera. Okay, but we just take all of the shock cord here. Um, and something else you can consider here is that some people like to have an additional Nomex protector for their shock cord and then uh, one on top of that for their parachute. Okay, if you want to do that, you'll have to get an extra protector there. Alright, so now I'm just going to put most of the shock cord down inside the body tube. All right, then my parachute here. I'm going to fold this into a triangle. All right, and every person has their own way of folding parachutes. Mine's not the only one. All right, but I'm going to take all of my shroud lines here at about the halfway point and just fold those up onto the parachute and then fold the sides over to cover those and then I'm just going to fold this in half and in half again All right, and then the parachute protector will go around this Okay. Uh, something else you can do and I know of several who do this is you can put some dog barf, some blown cellulose wadding down inside the, the body tube before you put this in that gives you even more protection. Right, so now this simply push down. It should go in fairly easily. If it doesn't, repack it. Okay. And then I'm off camera here. 
don't have enough hands underneath the camera. All right, and then we'll just slide these together. Okay, now usually it's not a problem, but we'll go ahead and do a shake test here. Make sure it's not coming out. It's actually in there pretty firmly. Um, if you're going to be sending up uh, this to really high altitudes, so if you're, you're going to max out the motor and try and get as high as you can, um, I recommend putting two 1 8 inch vent holes somewhere in the body tube below the coupler. And that just keeps it from over pressurizing as it goes up in altitude really quickly. Okay, um, basically, if, you know, if, if you're flying below 2,000 feet, you probably don't need to worry about it. All right, so that, going here from tip down to fins here is about it. Uh, oh, I do have to, one other thing you don't want to forget. All right, remove the tape from the uh, motor retainer and go ahead and put the outer ring on there. There we go, looks pretty sharp. I and hope you had a great time building this kit and hopefully not as many headaches as I had with it. Have a great flight and a safe recovery. And please stay tuned for more of my videos.